humble and a person of humility to say, you know what, I trust you, God. I trust you. No matter what's going on, you know what's better for me. And this is nothing compared to what you have in store for me, Lord God. If I trust you with humility. See, humility means a modest or low view of one's importance. Humbleness. Amen. You know, and it's so hard these days. You know, with, with the world and with everything that's just going on, it's, it's very difficult to be people of humility to where we think of others more than our own life. You know, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, even our lost family members, our lost children, to have humility for them. I'm not saying to baby them, but I'm saying to, to have humility for them. You know what? To have compassion and, and to love them and to always be ready to, to, to share the gospel with them, to share your faith with them. You know, my wife had a perfect, perfect chance yesterday with, with her grandparents. They all, they're selling their home and, you know, they all went over there and in, in, in a difficult situation where many of them ain't saved and many of them are self-centered and only care about themselves and, you know what I mean, and they want to be the biggest voice and, you know, and all that stuff, you know what I mean? But to look and to be humble and not to say nothing and to wait for that perfect time to be able to share your faith with the family because that might be the only time that they ever get to hear about what God is doing in somebody's life because they don't know the Lord like we know the Lord. You know, there's many that say that they know the Lord, but they don't know the Lord like we know Him. Why? Because we have a personal relationship with Him. He's not just some figurine on, on, on a cross or, you know, a picture upon the wall or maybe your, your Bible that you see that's on the shelf, you know what I mean, that's never been read, you know. It's, it, it's more than that. It, it's personal. And to be able to be a humble, a person of humility and, and waiting for the right opportunity to be able to share that with an individual is just such a blessing. I want you to go with me this morning to John chapter 3 verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Humility. You know, humility is, is, is when, you know, when, when, when the Lord means more than you think of yourself. You know what I mean? He becomes the most dominant, you know, influence or the most dominant, you know, person that's seen in your life. It isn't about you. You know, while so many people in the world got it backwards, it's me first and then the Lord. When it's not like that. You know what? It's Him first and He must increase and we must decrease. You know, we got to care more about the things of God. We got to care more about Him than we do about ourselves. Than we do about anything else. It has to be about God. And He must increase. And we must decrease. Amen. Go with me to Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You know what? Living for the Lord. You know what, Lord? It isn't about my job. You know what, Lord? It isn't about my house. It isn't about materials. It isn't about what I wear. It isn't about, you know, all these other things that are of no importance. But it's all about you. To live for me is to live, is to live for Christ. And how do we live for Christ? We live for Christ by, you know, being obedient. We live for Christ by, by, by following Him, by trusting Him. It's called faith. You know, a perfect example of faith was, was the widow with the little bit of oil that she had left. You know what? She came, in, she came across Elisha. And Elisha told her because her husband had just passed away. And, and she didn't know what she was going to do. And, and Elisha told her, he said, 
Send your kids out there. Go to your neighbors and collect all these empty jars or empty empty vessels. Go collect them and bring them back into your house and shut the door and, and, and begin to pour oil into there. You know, and she poured oil into those into those into those jars, and she ran out. You know, she went. She told. She goes. I ran out, and he goes. Well, go and sell what you have. And she goes, and keep the rest for yourself and live off of it. Amen. But see, the most important thing that we, that we pass by in, in that story is that those vessels represented our faith. Uh, faith. They represented our faith, and that oil was only able to be poured out according to your faith. You know, so many people lack faith these days. We put, uh, we put a hindrance on what God can do. You know what? God is, He can do anything. Amen. You know, but it's our faith. You know, how much faith will you have? You know, the faith of, of, of a mustard seed. That little seed can turn into a big tree. One of the biggest trees that's out there. You know, and, and it's represented as, as faith. You know, but how much faith do we have? You know, through humility, we begin to have that faith. That we can trust the Lord in anything. Whether we're, you know, stricken with some kind of illness or disease. You know what? Having faith that no matter what the outcome may be, Lord God, if I may pass away or, you know, if you decide to heal me or whatever it may be, my faith is in you. And no matter what happens, you know what, God? I know it's for your glory and for your honor, Lord God. I don't ever want to put a limit on what God can do. Because once we do that, He can't do nothing for us. Go with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Did he say giving preference to yourself or did he say to one another? another. You know, what's the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ? What's the needs of our, of our family members? What's the needs of, of those people that are out there that are, that are messed up, that are, you know, that are, that are in sin, that are lost? You know what? That need to be found, but what's the need? You know, we are to put preference on others and not ourselves when so many times, you know, we have it backwards. It's us first and then them. You know what, Lord? It's, it's, it, you, I got to make sure I, I'm, I'm taken care of first because what good am I going to be to anybody else if I, if, if, I ain't, if I ain't in the right state of mind? You know what? No. You know what? It has to be about others first. You know what? In order to be able to let healing take place within our minds and within our spirit and with everything else, we have to focus on the needs of other people so that God can move in our lives and, and do what He needs to do in us. Amen. Do what He needs to do in us. You know, a lot of times we'll see people that are, you know, they're, they're just in need. You know, we'll even think we can even leave from here or whatever, you know, we can have... It's our last five dollars for the whole week. Man, this is my last five dollars, Lord. I can buy me, you know, a little dollar sandwich every day, you know what I mean, until the end of the week. But yet there's somebody out there in need who hasn't ate in weeks or maybe in a whole, you know, a couple days, you know what I mean? And that five dollars could go farther for that individual than it would go for us. And it would mean a lot more to them than it does to us. You know, instead of giving it away and allowing God to overflow in abundance and, and mercy and to be able to do mighty things, we hoard the things of God. None of this stuff belongs to us. Everything belongs to the Lord. See, we don't live life for selfish gain anymore. We don't live life for self, but we live it for Him. And once we learn to do that, man, God will supply our every need. Go with me to Mark chapter 12, verses 30 through 31. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And this is the first commandment. And the second is like it. It is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. 
Humility. Humility. Loving God more than we love ourselves and loving others more than we love ourselves. Humility. We have to learn that it has nothing to do with us. But we are instruments and we are tools and we are open vessels to be poured into, to be used for the Lord, to bring glory and honor to Him and Him alone. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 9 through 15. And and I want to show you something here with, with, with humility. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariots and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan. Hold on, let's just stay right there real quick. Now Naaman, he was, you know, he was a very powerful man. He had leprosy. You know, leprosy is probably what you consider, you know, I can't say it's what you consider, but, you know, you could kind of put it on the lines of, of AIDS. Today, it was something that, that, that was, was, could kill you. You know what I mean? And it had different kinds of forms, some more severe than, than the rest. But usually at the end of it, most people died of leprosy. Most people died of it. And now this man had leprosy and he, and he was a well-known man. And, and, you know, and, and, and what had happened is, is, is a young girl had came that, that, that was taken captive and, you know, and she, they knew the Lord and, he, and, and, and she told him, I know somebody that, that, that can heal you because back in that time, there wasn't too many you know, prophets around anymore. Why? Because most of the people had pushed the prophets out to the outside. The men of God, they didn't want to hear from the men of God and they wanted to lean on their own understanding and they wanted to do things their own way, the way that they wanted to do them. And the only time that they wanted to consult in, in, in people that were, you know, speaking to the Lord, that had a direct line with the Lord were when they were in trouble or when something was going on, not when things were going good. Only when things were bad did they want to hear from a man of God. So now... We, we, we read here, and, and, and she, she told him to go to Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Nahum became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abrana and the Parafar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. And his servant came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? And how much more than when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides and came and stood before him and he said, indeed, now I know that there is no God in all, that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. See, now, like I told you that Nahum, he was, he was, you know, well-known man. Had everything that he needed. He wasn't a man of humility. You know, he expected Elisha to come down and greet him. He expected Elisha to come down and to wave his hand over him and to, to heal him of his leprosy. Why? Because Nahum wanted his way. He wanted it his way. You know what? And he got offended and said that he was mad. When he didn't get his way, why? Because Elisha didn't even go down to meet him. He sent his buddy down there to go and tell him. You know what? And being that guy being a man of honor, he expected this guy to come down and to greet him. You know how many of us do the same thing? Not even having to be a man of honor or even that, but you know, we expect people to do things for us. 
And when it doesn't go the way that we want it, we get offended or we get upset. When it has nothing to do with us, Amen. it's called being hum having humility. Amen. Why? Because it's not your way. Right. And a lot of times people could save themselves a heartache and they could save themselves all kinds of trouble if they would just be men and women of humility. Why? Because things don't go the way that we want them to go. And we ought to know that, you know, as growing up, that things just don't work out always the way that we expect them to work out. You know, and if we learn to become people of humility, you know what, our lives would be so much easier. Amen. So much easier. You know, the book of First and Second Kings was actually one book. And then they, they, they separated into two. But a lot of times when we as people go and we read through the whole Old Testament, you know, when we read a lot about wrath. And we forget a lot about the blessings and the promises of God. You know what? There's so much good things that come out of the Old Testament as far as God wanting to bless and, and, and help people and the promises of God. But yet we focus on all the judgments and all the things that are going on because of people of disobedience. And a lot of times now what happens is right now in, in our community and in, in our nation, you know, what people are doing is... You know, they're, they're, and it's very much, and it relates to the book of First and Second Kings. Mm -hmm. If we could read it and we could understand what's taking place in our nation right now, That's right. you know, and we could see that in First and Second Kings that many people follow false gods, yes, technology, materialism, and war, and the true worship of God is rare on the earth right now. The true worship of God is rare on earth right now. Why? Because too many people are, are, are looking out their false gods and technology and materialism. And it has nothing to do with being humili humili having humility. Right. has nothing to do with the having humility. That's right. It's all about what I can get. You know, and some of us, we might be on a higher scale. Some people might be up here where, you know, where it's all about them. You know, some people might be on a middle level and some people might be, you know, even on a lower scale of it. But there's still a lot of people that have a hard time being people of humility. Of humility. Man, this was a heavy duty story of Nahum. You know, a lot of people nowadays, they think everything's owed to them. They deserve everything. Mm -hmm. When well, we don't deserve a thing. That's right. I know what the Bible says we're deserving of. Mm -hmm. Death. That's right. Death. Mm -hmm. You know, thank God that he was a man of humility, that Jesus came and he was full of humility. <laughs> full of humility. That he showed us, you know what I mean, that this walk, you know what I mean, that we walk, it, it wasn't an easy walk, but it was, it was you, could, you could obtain it if we would humble ourselves, if we would never think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, if we would always put God first. God first. God first. You know, I, I see so many things going on, and, and, and it's just, it, it boggles my mind sometimes. And I always have to go to the Lord in prayer and I have to thank Him. And I have to tell Him, you know what, Lord, change me. Amen, amen. You know, continue changing me, Lord. Why? Because I don't want to be selfish. You know, if, even if I can't see, you know, that, that I'm selfish, you know what, show me, Lord, because somewhere down inside of me there's, there's some selfishness. You know what, and it has to be dealt with and I got to give it to you, Lord God. You know, and, and to never, you know, think of yourself more highly than you ought to. That's right. That's right. Because we put ourselves above the things of God. Right. You know, go with me to Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. And I want to talk to you a little bit. Just this one little quick verse with, with Moses here. Now, a lot of times we read over this stuff, 
You know, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. You know, and how many of you know are familiar with Jethro? He was a he was a Druid. He was a Druid. Now Druids they 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 believed in, in in many different things, you know what I mean? But they believed in that he was he was a prophet and that he spoke to the Lord. We read we read differently in, in the word of God that you know what I mean that he was influenced by by Moses. But he also was a very influential person. Why? Because Moses listened to him. Moses took a lot of advice from his father-in-law Jethro in a lot of things. Even when it came to leading the people, he took the best advice that he could from his father-in-law where he told him, you know what, you shouldn't be carrying all this burden. He said, you know what, what you got to do is you got to you got to focus on on the things that you need to be focused on and you need to pick some some men that you can trust and you need to have them look over the affairs of these people and and let them handle the more simpler things. And when it comes to the more complicated things, he goes, then we'll come to you with those things. He said, but that way, you know, it won't be so overbearing for you. You know, we read here that Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. He was always close to the place of God. But we got to understand something here with Moses. He was a man of humility. You want to know why? Because he came from Egypt. He was the prince of Egypt. You know what? He had all the finest things. He had all the gold, all the money, all the education, all the good stuff. But for him to become a sheep herder, and even for his father-in-law Jethro, you have to be a man of humility to come from something like that and to set yourself back to some place over here, but to do it wholeheartedly. To do it, you know what I mean, with everything that you got. You know what? He was a good sheep herder. He took care of those sheep. And he always took them up there by Mount Horeb, close to God. You know what? A good pastor will always want to take you closer to the Lord. Not farther away from Him. He wants to take you closer to God and He wants you to be close to Him. Humility. Humility. Just like brothers and sisters in Christ, you know what? They want you to, to see the Lord for who He really is. Yes, they want you to have, you know what, a true relationship with Him. Amen. A true relationship with Him. They're not fascinated by, by technology and the things of the world and all these things that could be flashing and getting you going. You know what? They want to give you the simple stuff. Amen. This is where it's at. This is where it is. Humility. Amen. Amen. Humility. And Moses was that example. Just like many other people with that example in the Bible that we read. Go with me to Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accused things for Achan, the son of Camri, the son of Zabdi, the son of uh, Zerah, and the tribe of Judah, took off, took of the accused things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. And do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about three thousand men went up, from, went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about thirty-six men. For they chased them from before the gate as far as Sherebrim and struck them down on the, de- on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes. 
and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. And the elders of Israel and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, the Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. See, Joshua was in a humble man right now. I want you to understand that. He was leaning on his own understanding. He didn't even consult in the Lord before he decided to go out into this battle with I. And I was very small. And he even, you know, downgraded, you know, he, he, he downgraded the army where he, you know, he said, Let's, we're going to send less men instead of more. And he went and what happened? He got defeated. How many know when, when we're not people of humility, we, we tend to do things on our own ability? And every time we do things on our own ability, what happens is we lose every time. We lose. We might think that we're winning. We might think that we're gaining, but we ain't winning and we ain't gaining nothing. Ultimately, in the end, we're losing. Why? Because spiritually, something's taking place inside of us. And we're thinking that, you know, that, that, that we're close to God and we're thinking that everything's good when we're doing everything on our own abilities. And we're wondering why, you know, that, that things just don't seem at ease and why things ain't just, you know, they're not easy. They're not settled. You know, it seems like we're always running into some kind of, some kind of wall. We're running into some kind of problem. And yes, we might get over it. We're getting into some kind of hurdle. But yet we're trying to do things on our own when God wants to make it easier for us. That's right. That's right. Humility. You know what? A lot of people perished in this thing too. Whether he had all those men, you know what, 30-something individuals is a lot of people to, to die because having a lack of humility. You know, a lot of times people in the church, we see so many people die spiritually because of lack of humility. We see so many family members dying spiritually because of lack of humility. Humility. You know, it took this, though, for Joshua to become a man of humility. You know, I don't know what it's going to take for, for many of us or many of those people out there to, to come to that place. But I pray that, that they would come to that place soon, sooner than later. That it would be today that they come to that place of humility where they begin trusting in the Lord, where they begin putting Him, you know, where He needs to be. He needs to be the head. He needs to be the main person, the main focus, the main one that we, we give our attention to, who we serve. So that way we could begin... You know, being brothers and sisters in Christ. That way we could begin loving one another the way that we're supposed to love one another. With a godly love. Amen. With a godly love. Yes, Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 7. Therefore, humble yourselves. Under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Go back to six. Humbling yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. How many of you, we want answers right now? Huh? Like today. Like right now, like this second, like this minute. I want an answer now. Does that sound like a person of humility to you? You know, and we need to consider this in our prayer life. Because a lot of times we get into our prayer closets or we start praying to the Lord and we're like, you know what, Lord, I need an answer now. No. You know what, Lord? Your will be done. And Lord, in your due time, Lord God, you will do what you need to do. But right now, humble me before you, Lord God. And Lord, right now, I'm waiting. I'm waiting because there's going to be a time. You know, a lot of times there's people that they want to be recognized and noticed right away. You see what I've been doing? You see how far I've come? You see this? You see that? Who cares? 
Not to say that nobody's watching, not to say that nobody pays attention, but guess what? In due time, guess who's going to exalt you? If you're not trying to be noticed, God will exalt you. God will exalt you Amen. when he's ready to exalt you. Right. Not when we're ready, but when he's ready. Amen. Amen. I didn't want to be a pastor. I knew that was my calling, but I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a youth pastor. I didn't want it. I didn't want nothing to do with it. I didn't want the responsibility. I didn't want the heartache. I didn't want anything to do with it. Why? Because I was living a very comfortable life. That's right. That's right. And it wasn't humble. That's right. Why? Because it was all about me. Yeah. All about me. Yeah. You know, and I've shared this with you guys hundreds of times, and you guys know it. Mm -hmm. Camping and all this other stuff. You know what? Me. 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 You know, when did serving the Lord ever come to doing what I wanted to do? Never. That's a, that's a view of the world. That's a view of somebody who's lied to us and who's deceived us because that's not what the Bible says. God never said that. Jesus never said that. It's never in the Bible where it says, you know what? Serve me the way that you want to serve me. Do whatever you want to do, and then you give me your bits and pieces and your scraps. That's not humility. That's right. We could pick out a whole bunch of scriptures in there to, to cater. And they're just one single scripture. But if we do it in context and we put the other hundred scriptures that go with that one scripture, then it will bring into life to us what it really means. Instead of just holding on to one scripture like so many people do. Like so many, you know, so many, I don't even, I'm not going to talk about men of God. You know, God has appointed people, but so many people will like to choose one scripture to prove a point that they're going through in their life instead of taking it in an entirety. It has to be an entirety. You know what? Serving the Lord is not easy. It's not. If it's easy for you, it's because there's a lot of selfishness in there. That's right. Because as soon as you get rid of yourself out of the way, you know what, and you have to start serving others and start putting others before yourself, then serving the Lord doesn't become so easy anymore. That's right. That's right. It's easy when you, when you got all your affairs in order and you're doing everything that you want to do. But when it comes to dying to self and when it comes to, you know, putting people before yourself, That's right. then the story changes. That's right. That's right. The story changes. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's a lot of things that I do like doing. Yeah. And you know what? And it gets in the way of me giving my whole heart to the Lord. But Lord, I got to go do this first. No, 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 no. That's not humility. You do God's will first. God's will first. Go with me to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Put these on. Kindness, meekness, humility, long-suffering, and mercies. You know, I remember my, my uncle told me one time, they had already planned a vacation. They already paid for the, for the, for the plane tickets. They already paid for the, for the room and board for the hotel, the, the, the place that they were going to stay at, and everything. And I'm talking about a family vacation, the wife, the kids, all of them. The day that they were supposed to leave, they got a phone call, or he got a phone call. 
And guess what? Canceled the trip. Why? Because God came first. And how many of us would say, you know what? Psh, I'm going to go on this vacation. I already paid for it. You know what? I got a spa over there waiting for me. I got all this stuff. We've been planning this for a whole year. Ain't nothing getting in the way of that. That is not humility. That's selfishness. And that is not serving God. That's serving yourself or the devil. Humility. I'm telling you, it has nothing to do with us. And we have to realize that, you know, we got to get this, we got to get this straight. We got to get, in, in, you know, in, in a real relationship with the Lord. Many people out there don't know how it is to serve the Lord because the men and women of God are not people of humility. They're people of self. Selfishness. Selfishness. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2. You know, and I could have gave you one verse to, to, to try to bring, bring across a point, but I'm not that kind of preacher. I like to give you verse in entirety, give you more than one. Now, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love. You know what? Sometimes there's going to be just like the story that I just shared of my, of my uncle. You know, there's going to be some times that you've got to make some sacrifices in your life to, to bear with one another in love. You're going to have to make some changes to your schedule. You're going to have to make some changes to your so important life that, that we think is so important. So that way we can go and, and bear with one another in love and long suffering. You know what? Serving the Lord has never been about us. It's not about us. It's about others. And yes, He will supply our every need. Yes, He will supply our every need. But it's not material needs. I want you to understand that. That's, that's backwards. He doesn't supply material needs. He supplies the needs that we, that we need spiritually. Spiritually. A sound mind. Peace. Humbleness, everything that we need from the Lord, the fruits of the Spirit. It has nothing to do with the house. It has nothing to do with the refrigerator. It has nothing to do with wealth. It has nothing to do with any of that stuff. That's of the world. The people of God were nomadic people. They lived out there in the desert. They fend for themselves. They, they raised their own sheep and their own cattle. And they made their own meals and they did it together. They were good old countrymen. They lived off the land. Amen. Had nothing to do with wealth and with possessions. You know what? This is something that we get from, 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 from America. America has turned the things of God into a prosperity message. That's right. That's right. That's right. A prosperity message. Mm -hmm. A charismatic movement. Where it's all about blessings. It's all about this. It's all, you know what? Serving the Lord isn't a charismatic movement. Right. It's not. Amen. Go with me to James chapter 4. And we're going to be, read verses 1 through 10. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Does that say that serving the Lord is easy right there? Huh? So many people think that serving the Lord is easy. Serving the Lord is not easy. And it says right here, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
Woo! James, chapter 1. Chapter 1. And in, verse, and in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blowing and tossed by the wind. That's a lack of faith. You know, so many Christians lack faith these days because they don't know the living God. Why? Because they're not men and women of humility. When you're men and women of humility, you have no choice but to trust the Lord in everything. Why? Because I don't know how I'm going to get my next meal. I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. I don't know how I'm going to get all this done. But I know God will make a way. I know God will make a way. Why? Because I trust Him. Because He always comes through. Because He's faithful. Verse 7 says that person should not, be, should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. Man, he's talking about the rich right there. People who think of themselves more highly than they ought to. You see it. And you see it all around. You see it in, in churches all around America. You see it everywhere. Like if people think that something's owed to them because they put money in the basket. You know, if that's good enough, you know what I mean? Hey, I, I did my good deed for the week. I went to church and I, I paid my offering or I, I, gave, I gave a tithe or whatever. Or, you know what? That's good enough for me. Don't tell me how I'm supposed to live my life. Don't tell me what scripture says. Just tell me all this other stuff, you know. Just talk about love. That's all I want to hear about is love. I just want to hear about prosperity. I just want to hear about all the good stuff. But I don't want to hear about how I should be conducting my life. Why? Because you're getting into my personal space. You know what? Our, our lives are supposed to be an open book. You know why so many people hold on to sin and why so many people keep in, in, stay in darkness the way they are is because they don't want to open their life as an open book. You know, a lot of people, we, we burned our sin out there on Friday night, Friday night prayer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I like where, I like where, where, where little Larry, you know, where little Larry, God bless him. You know, he was right. When many of us might think he was wrong, he was right. That's right. When he said, you know what, my dad's going to throw his cigarettes in there, exposing him. That's Why? Right. Because when you're exposed, guess what? When you're an open book, it's easier for God to move in your life and to break chains off. But when you want to keep everything in secret and you don't want nobody to know what's going on, guess what? You stay that way. You stay that way. Want everybody to know. Why? Because when everybody knows, you're held accountable. Right. Nah, brother, I thought you threw your cigarettes in there. Then why you smell like cigarettes today? Huh? <laughs> I thought you threw it in the bucket. Yeah. Huh? Amen. Let's get on with it. Hallelujah. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ Amen. here. Amen. But you know what? We need to let all that stuff out in the open. Yes. Why? Because it pushes us. It pushes us to change. Now go with me to James chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 through 10 in James chapter 4. And he says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Amen. Your desires that battle within you? Why do we have so much trouble submitting to the, to the perfect will of God? Because of those things that are inside of us that we just don't want to let go of? The flesh. Yep, the flesh. You desire, but do not have. So you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Ooh. Man, we're too busy asking our brothers and sisters, and, you know. Well, how did you get to where you're at in your life? 
Well, how did you do this and how did you do that? And they tell you, I, 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 I. They sound like those birds on, the, on Finding Nemo. I, 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 I. Huh? I, I, I. Instead of saying, I read the word. You know what? This is the scripture I held on to. This is what the Lord said. This is what the Lord told me. This is, this is where the Lord brought me from this. Not I, 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 I. I went to this school. I went to this class. I went to that. You know, I see so many people. And I'm, you know, and I, I, I love school and all that too. You know what I mean? But there's not too many people that actually come out of, out of, uh, out of Bible seminary or at a Bible college that are actually grounded in the Word of God. They might know the Word, but they don't serve the Lord that the way that they should. And most of them, they've done it to be more of a, like, like entrepreneurs and enterprise. And they've turned churches and all kinds of stuff like that. When so many of them, they know what they should be doing. And they got some good backgrounds. But a lot of them, they don't use it for the glory of God. And he says, and when you ask, you do not, do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Does that sound like selfishness? Does that sound like humility to you? Is that humility to you that we're, we're spending all our stuff on our selfish pleasures? Oh, man, I need me a new sweater. Guess what? I just got paid. I'm going to go buy me a new sweater instead of paying my tithes. Huh? Instead of giving an offering, guess what I'm going to go do? I'm going to go buy me a new sweater. Oh, man, I need this. I'm going to get I need a new Cuisinart. I need me a new little waffle flapjack thingy. I'm going to buy that. I need me some new guns. I need to go get me some new guns. Pastor Leon better be cool. I don't need no more guns. I need to chill out. Huh? Man. Why? Because it's all for me. What, what am I going to do when the Lord comes? Them guns are staying. Everything that I've got for myself is staying here. But you know what? What I can give out to somebody and what I can do for somebody else is a whole much better. It's better. Man, I have a hard time at work. You know, and I believe that's why the Lord brought Misa to to, to come work with me. Because I have a hard time at work with uh, training somebody. Because, you know what, I don't want, I, I can train somebody, but the whole thing is I don't, you know what I mean, like, I don't want to train them. Because, you know, it's like, I, no, I, I don't, I don't want to train them, man. I'm like, man, you know what, I was like, because, you know, I, I do things a certain way, and, and I, do, I do them good. I'm a good steward, but at the same time, at the end of the day, I'm thinking about the company, and I'm like, man, these guys, they want me to train somebody better than myself so that way they can get rid of me and pay somebody a lot cheaper to do the job that I do. And I said, I ain't having it. <laughs> you know what? I ain't having it. Why? Because they can get rid of me in a heartbeat and pay somebody less than what they pay me to do the same job. Yeah. But the Lord sent me Misa. Amen. And, and I told him, I was like, I go, you know what, brother? I said, I go, I want you to, I'm going to train you better than, than what I do. Why? So that way you do everything better than I do it. Why? Because you know what? You, 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 you deserve that. And me being a steward of the Lord, you know what? I'm supposed to be doing that. I'm supposed to be training you even better than what I know. So that way you can be better than what I do. Better. How many of us are pouring our lives into somebody instead of being selfish, but being men and women of humility? Why? So people could be better than what we are. Better. Better worshipers. Better prayers. Better servants. Amen. Better people that glorify God better than we do it better. Man, with a bigger heart. With a bigger heart. He goes on to say in verse 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means an enmity with God or an enmity against God? Friendship with the world? Man, how come the Christians want to be so much like the world? Man, everything that we're doing in every walk of life, in every, in every business, in everything that we're going, everybody wants to emulate the things of the world. 
We're supposed to come out of that. Yes. You know what? You got a lot of people that say, oh, I don't want to tell people I'm a Christian. Why? Because then I might not get. We, we, we just bought, we bought, I bought a car for my wife. And you know, and, and we went in there and we, and we talked to the guy and, and he was, he was a Christian. And, and, you know, and I said he had a couple magazines on there, you know what I mean? And he goes, I got a couple magazines, National Geographic and all that, and maybe some kids' books. The kids want to read a book or whatever, you know what I mean? And his man, he goes, I was thinking about putting some Christian magazines in there, but, uh, you know, I don't want people to, to think something different of me. I said, what's wrong with you? I said, you want them to know that you're a Christian. Put some Christian books in there, bro. I said, watch your sales increase. Watch you make more sales. Well, no, no, no. Now, so many people, they don't want people to, to know. They, they want it just a little bit. Yeah, I'm a Christian. And they leave it at that. They leave it at that. I'm a Christian. But yet they don't want to share their faith. Why? Because they don't want to lose a sale. You know what? If you don't want to know about my God, then you don't deserve this sale. Exactly. And that goes flat out across the board. Any kind of job that, that, that there's out there. If you're putting the way, ways of the world and implementing the ways of the world, you have no business doing what you're doing. You better get right and you better humble yourself. Why? Because God wants to bless you. But if you will not put God first and honor Him, He cannot bless you the way that He wants you to. Amen. You know what? I ain't selling nothing to nobody unless they, unless, you know, unless they want to hear about the Lord. That's right. Period. Therefore, if anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy against God. Verse 5. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the jealousy longs for the Spirit and He has cause to dwell in us, but He gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Amen, amen. He opposes the proud. Amen. That's and we think, we're, we think we're serving the Lord. Yeah. All puffed up in pride and doing things in arrogance. And you know what? He's opposing that. That's right. And we think God's blessing us. You know what? God ain't blessing you. The devil's blessing you. Yeah, the devil could bless you too. You don't think so? Look at all these rock stars. Look at all these people, all these rappers and all these people out there who are getting wealthy. And they think it's from the Lord because they say Jesus every once in a while. Or they say that they're a Christian or this and that. That don't mean nothing. Better watch out who's blessing you. Why? Because it could be taken away overnight. But what God blesses you with, no man can ever take away from you. Verse 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Is the Christian walk always supposed to be happy? Ha <laughs> I'm up in the clouds. No! You better come down from that cloud nine and start mourning. Oh, man. Verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Verses 6 and 10, I want you to pay close attention to. Verse 6 said, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. 
Clothe yourselves with humility. Because God opposes the proud. Man, look at me. You know, I'm, I'm grateful for our little church that we got here. Amen. <laughs> There's times that I walk in and I have to ask the Lord to forgive me. And I'm like, Lord, when is there going to be more? And I have to right away, Lord, forgive me, Lord. Why? Because those that are humble, those that are not proud, those that resist, guess what? God is exalted in it. God is exalted in it. Go with me to Second Chronicles chapter 7. Now check this out. Solomon. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good. His love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. So the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their portion, as did the Levites with the Lord's musical instruments, which King David had made for praising the Lord, and which were used when he gave thanks, saying, he, His love endures forever. Opposite the Levites, the priests blew their trumpets, and all the Israelites were standing Solomon consecrated the middle part of the courtyard in front of the temple of the Lord. And there he offered burnt offerings and fat of the fellowship offerings because the bronze altar he had made could not hold the burnt offerings, the grain offerings and the fat portions. So Solomon observed the festival at that time for seven days and all Israel with him, a vast assembly, people from Lebo Hamath and Wadai of Egypt on the eighth day they held an assembly for they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for the seven days and the festival for seven days more on the 23rd day of the seventh month he sent the people to their homes joyful and glad in their hearts for good things the Lord had done for David and Solomon and for his people Israel and when Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I want you to see something here. We've seen all the glory of that temple. You know, we've seen all the good. We've seen all the stuff that they did. You know, but God wanted to remind him here of something. He said, I have heard your prayer. And I have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name will be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will always be there. You know, when those hard times come. You know, you can see all the good stuff and all the glory and all that good, all that stuff out there. And it's easy to praise and offer sacrifices in the temple. It's easy to come to church. It's easy to give your tithe. It's easy to give your offering. It's easy to do all this stuff when you see all the glory and the good stuff. But he said when the famine, when all the pestilence, when all that bad stuff comes, he says, then if you will seek my face, pray and turn from your wicked ways, 
Then I will hear from heaven. And then I will heal your land. It ain't about all that stuff on the outside. It's through the hard times and the hardship. And in verse 17 says, As for you, if you walk before me faithfully as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I, uh, as I covenanted with David your father when I said you shall never fail to have successors or to rule over Israel. But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and the commands I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and I will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. This temple will become a heap of rubble, and all who pass by will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer because they have forsaken the Lord the God of their ancestors who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. And that is why he brought all this disaster on them. Aren't you the temple of the living God? And as a temple of the living God, we are to serve him. In those bad times, when everything's going wrong, we are to give Him honor and glory. We are to be men and women of humility. Humility. Not just when everything is going good. Not when everything, when the ball's in our court and everything seems like it's okay. You know what? Not to come to church just because it's the biggest church out there. Because they have a parking lot and because they offer all these classes and do all these things. It has nothing to do with all that stuff. You know what? Right here is the temple. And right here we shall not desecrate that temple. And when we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, and when we put ourselves before the things of God, that is not humility. And we desecrate the temple of the living God. And disaster will be upon us, it says. Go with me to Luke chapter 14, verses 7 7 through 23. I got one more verse after that. We'll come to a close. So he told the parable to those who were invited. And when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and he... And him come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with, you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place. So that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said to him, Who invited him? When you give a dinner or a supper, do you not ask your friend, your brothers, your relatives, nor your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back, and you be repaid? But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Go on. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. Not so many people make excuses for the things of God these days. My job, I'm busy, I got this first, I got to do that first. 
You know what? We chose this day, Sunday, to be a day of Sabbath, a consecrated holy day. And we are not supposed to set that apart for nobody, for nothing, not our jobs, not anybody. If Sunday comes, we are to be at church in the house of God with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I know there's an exception to some people. You know, you got shut-ins who are, who are elderly and old and they can't make it. But you know, they can watch TV or whatever. But if you have no excuse, guess what? Something's wrong. Something's wrong. And he says, and make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. He's talking about real estate right there. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to test them. Somebody who's working in the meat market. He's, a, he's one of those meat cutters now. Huh? He works at King Supers. They make me work on Sunday, man. All these Mexicans want to eat menudo all the time. Huh? Jeez, man. Steaks and all this stuff. I got to make an excuse. And then there is go on. Still another said... I have a married wife, and therefore I cannot come. Why? Because the wife don't want to serve the Lord. But he does. Well, i got to make an excuse. This is the only day that I could stay and be with him. i got to make this day for, for her. Huh? This is our only day. Nope. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded and still there is room. Amen. Amen. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Christians, That's right. That's right. the so-called Christian this day, that have already been invited, oh, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I already got a, a seat at the, at the table at the marriage banquet. No, you don't. Through your faithfulness and through your humility and through your servanthood, through serving God, not through doing what you want to do. And he says, for I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Now, great multitudes went with him. And he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, also he cannot be my disciple. You know, he meant to mention all kinds of other people, but I like the very last one, himself. That's right, that's right. Himself. Mm -hmm. See, when you remove yourself, it's easier for you to remove yourself from all these other individuals. Yeah. But when you're all about self, it's hard for you to remove yourself from all these other individuals. You always put them first. You know what? I ain't missing that marriage banquet for nobody. Yeah. Not for my wife, not for my children, not for the church, not for nobody. Nobody. You know what? If my wife wants to get left behind, she's going to get left behind. If my children want to get left behind, guess what? They can get left behind. If the church wants to get left behind, guess what? They can get left behind. But I ain't going to get left behind. And my wife feels the same way. I guarantee you. She said the same thing. If my husband wants to get left behind, he's going to get left behind. Because I ain't going to miss it for nobody. <laughs> and I'm going to close 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Did he say your wealth? Did he say your possessions? Did he say all that other stuff? No, he said, my grace is sufficient enough for you. For my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities 
that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Who, Lord. If my life is easy and everything's all good, you better change it right now. Because I need to see you more clearly in these last days. See, so many people are so comfortable these last days and relaxed in these last days that they're not humble. They don't have humility. That they don't see the God that we see. They don't see the living God that we see. They see a false God. They see false prophets. They see false evangelists. They see false teachers. And they're leading the way. They're all over the place. They're all over. And the Bible warned us about them. But you know what? We need to see the living God. We need to see God for who He is. And that comes through humility and that comes through hardship. And that's when things ain't easy. That's when we begin to trust in God. That's when we begin to rely on God. That's when we begin to call out on Him and say, Lord, I need you because your grace is sufficient enough for me. Not my possessions. Lord, why do you think He told the people to sell all their possessions and to go follow Him? Why? Because they didn't know the real God. They knew the God that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were talking about. And it wasn't the real God. It wasn't the living God. So many people right now are blind. And they see the same God that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were talking about. You know what? They see the devil. The devil who is an angel of light. You know what? He isn't that person walking around with horns all scary to frighten you on, on Halloween like everybody thinks. He was the most beautiful, angelic being that there was and grafted with sat fire. And he was pleasant to look upon and he knew how to play music very well and speak very well. The most cunningest creature on the face of the earth. That's right. That's right. Does that sound like something scary to you? No. That sounds like something that will get our attention, something that will make us look at God in a different way, not for who he really is. Yes. Twist it. That's right. Church, we need to serve the living God. And we got to do that through humility. If you would stand with me here today. I know a lot of times, sometimes we have a hard time, you know, hearing some of the messages that, that, that I preach. And that's fine. But you know what? The truth will set you free. Amen. The truth will set you free. And you know what? I pray that today as we come up to this altar that we would be people of humility and ask God to humble us and ask God to open our eyes and open our ears so that way we'll hear Him and not the God of this world, but Him. The God of the universe. Yes. 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 The God who created all of us. Yes. Yes. The God who owns everything. And who loves us so dearly and deeply. I want to open this altar for you and I this morning. Let's come down and let's trust in the Lord this morning. God bless you.